Hey, 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 good morning. It is Cyber Church Sunday time. Goodness gracious, how I love you guys. And those of you listening now live, those that listen later, God bless you both. Let's pray. Father, we just pray that you show up, that you do beautiful things in hearts all over the world. Whenever somebody comes on here, Lord, that they would just see you, experience you, and know you more deeply. In Jesus' name, hey. I am um, thrilled to, to tell you guys there's a lot of movement of things going on. Thank you for your support. Thank you for all that's going on. I mentioned on um, Friday, I mentioned on Zoe Life Friday, that I, I never talk about the giving of this ministry, but I do want you to know that uh, for everything that you guys are doing, we're extending things. Things are happening elsewhere. There's work going on in the anti-abortion movement. There's work going on through a number of facilities here in town um, that take care of homeless and take care of battered wives. And, and the things that happen here <clears throat> trickle into Calvary Chapel now and all of the mission uh, field around the world that they have going on. So I want you to know that you're, you're making a difference by your um, giving, by your praying, by your concern, by your encouragement here. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, I started thinking oh, quite a while ago about this subject. You know, the very, as far as I can tell, the very first, um, it, it, I also want to say this on the front end about the word of God, about PhDs and about theologians, never confessed, never professed, never conveyed that I was this great theologian. I, in fact, I believe most ministry is wrong. I'm pretty, I'm pretty solid on my viewpoints about uh, how I share it. And by the way, I'm always willing to be corrected and and realigned with things that are deeper in the Lord. But here's what I think. Um, the disciples weren't theologians. The possible exception might be Paul because <clears throat> he knew that he knew the Torah, you know, inside and out. And within a very short period of time, three years, these 12 men changed the world because they lived the word. They understood the word and the, the word of God and the, and the word of God in, the, in terms of the New Testament, of course, wasn't even there yet happened long decades and decades after the, the death of Christ. So what does this mean? It means don't undervalue the power of reading that word every day. And I'm going to really talk about, well, how does Satan affect us? And I have read volumes. I have read the word of God cover to cover several times, but subjects, I love to go deep into subjects, right? Um, a book that influenced me greatly was by somebody I used to be incredibly close to, Dr. Jim Richards, and he has this book called um, Satan Unmasked, and there's a certain perspective there. I encourage you to read it, um, but I want to tell you that my viewpoint, opinion, perspective comes from a variety of different things, and I'm always willing, you know, this is the whole current Joe Rogan controversy that he actually listens to all sides, I thought I had this um, proverb memorized. I thought it was 1617 or 1716, but it says that one side seems legit until you hear the other. Now I'm paraphrasing it. It actually talks about a court case that one side of the, of the court proceeding seems legit until you hear the other. It's common sense. And when we can't listen to both sides of any argument, let me just tell you, you're violating the word of God. You are playing into Satan's hands. See, the way Satan works quite a bit different. I'll bet you if you stick to the end, I'm going to blow your mind because I, I discovered things I've never read, I've never heard other than the word of God. Sorry for my nose. It's uh, in the morning. It's always kind of itchy around here because of whatever's in the air. Um, I'm going to blow your mind, man. I'm going to show you that there was attributes given to Satan, at the beginning of his creation. They were also given to you. And how it influences us is, is really quite astounding. And uh, I, I grabbed the word of God, and I'm, I'm going to refer a lot to um, 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 Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, if you want to go back to those later. Um, but I'm probably going to use my desktop here because I put all kinds of notes because this study Bible of mine is not New King James. And I I'm, I'm tend to be in the New King James now more than before, not because of a religious zealot way of thinking back in the 70s. Um, I've heard all those arguments. God bless you if you're really pro to that. I know from my rather diligent study of different translations, there's 
um, strengths and weaknesses in all of them. There's some that have less strengths and less, less weaknesses for sure, but in all of them, I'll tell you what the key is, go to the original language. Go to blueletterbible.org if you don't have anything else and look up the original language. So let me ask you something. Who would carry your coffin if you were to pass away? Generally speaking, these are the people, those six people most closely associated. So they're, they're the people that were walking through life, the journey that we all go through the most intimately with these people, or there was just no connection at all. And they were the, three, the six people that had to carry. And that's a sad life, a very sad life. You know what the problem is as people grow older? We, and I'm an old man, <laughs> we get into this groove of isolation. It is one of the tactics of the enemy. We were born to connect. So one of the tactics of Satan to destroy your life is when you start getting comfortable being all alone. I'm not saying there's never a time to be alone, never time to get connected to God, never time to go uh, uh, and spend time with yourself, healing, thinking, processing. I do it a lot. I'm saying a lifestyle that becomes less and less and less connected to others, others, that's like a brother, <laughs> is a fool's journey in life. It leads to emptiness. It leads to loneliness. It leads to depression. Why? 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 Easily, easy. In fact, what you're doing alone is is anesthesia. You're doing, you know, you're listening to, you're watching movies and losing yourself in Netflix or whatever it is that the technology is destroying your life on. Because I'm going to show you in living color, one of the top reasons that Satan has power over us is that we're not adhering to the three pillars of connection to God. And I'm going to show you how it started in the garden it infl infiltrated Satan's being, his angelical being. And Satan, I think, like, uh, um, as far as I can tell, there's three archangels, three highly, uh, let's call them God's general angels. There was Gabriel, there was Michael, and there was Satan. I like the name Michael. Is it possible that those three beings ha literally have an effect on us today? I would suggest it is everything. And I, I got to tell you, man, Let's go back to the, we'll get to that in a second, those three angels, because they're going to blow your mind. I'm actually having my mind blown. So I'm just sharing with you what this was like for me. Because you see, nothing you'll ever hear in church or here or anything else or any place else has an impact on your mouth on your on your life beyond what you ponder, consider, think on the rest of that day. So, Lord, if that's true, I call it the gospel of now what? So what now? Lord, if this is true, what do I do? So what now what? Now what do I do? You should be living different if you get a message. You should be thinking different if you get a message. You should be renewing your mind with everything you ever hear about God. And this one, this one is big. So let's go back to the six before I go to the three angels, the six pallbearers. They're the people that generally influenced you. So on a zero to 10, 10 meaning zero, they add no value. 10 meaning they're incredibly wise. They add, they add a lot. Are they positive or negative influences? Just think about those six people right now. If I could write them down, if you got a piece of paper and then ask yourself on a zero to 10, just don't, by the way, don't think, just feel. This is one of the most important thing in personal development. Just tell me that the score is that you feel because you can overthink it. Okay, so Mary, let's just say one of them's name's name, Mary. Zero to 10, how positive? And she's always negative, so she's a three. Um, Bob, uh, Bob is always, every, day, every time I need something, he's there. He's just a very smart guy. He's a very wise person. Ooh, wisdom, a seven or an eight or a nine. Now, here's my point. You need to start separating yourself from the negative, unwise, worldly view folks in your life. Why? I'm not saying don't love them. I'm not saying shut them off. I'm not saying don't have a relationship with them. I'm saying just put them over here. By the way, when I started doing this, 
and I've diligently done it in my life. Some of the biggest business people, when I went into full-time ministry, they did it to me. Oh, there's no more money we can make from Michael. <laughs> there's no more connections we can make from Michael. He's totally in this ministry lane. It's quite interesting to see how people do it to you all the time for their own selfish reasons, but God's waking you up. Why? Because he's waking you up to do it for godly reasons. Where? Book of Proverbs. It says that iron sharpens iron. The people that walk with the wise become wise. The, the company of fools leads to destruction. Y'all, some of y'all are hanging out with fools. Think about that. And you know, um, sometimes, and I, and I thought about, so I saw this meme the other day. It says, if you didn't know you were a uh, flipping idiot when you were a kid, you're still an idiot today. I thought about some of the people that I, hung out with in my 20s and my 30s and probably a lot of my life too much. And I thought to myself, you chose those people. Those influences, whether you think you're kind of, I don't care who I hang out with, you know, it's not going to rub off on me. Well, the Bible says it does. The word of God says it does. Oh, let me ask you a question. Anytime you come up against the word of God and it says something that you are living different, thinking different, or believing different, who's supposed to change? The word of God or you? As simplistic of a thought as that is. I got to tell you, man, that is, I have tripped over that speed bump way too many times. Where, well, you know, I like that part of the, the Bible, but I don't believe in that part. Smorgasbord Jesus, buffet Jesus. I don't really like the pork and I don't really like that kind of vegetable. And I don't, what? I don't know why I'm talking like that. Don't be a, a smorgasbord buffet Jesus follower. It's an empty life. Why? I was listening. Uh, I think I shared this on another broadcast. And uh, I want to make sure my phone's on. Uh, do not disturb. And I was, I was, uh, yeah, it is. And I was talking to uh, uh, Cindy Ellis. And she reads, she's going through an interesting part of her life right now. She's reading a book of a uh, uh, chapter of Proverbs every single day, sometimes a couple times a day, two different chapters. And I thought about the power. I want you to think of something, by the way. The Bible, I do believe reading the word of God is incredibly important. In fact, God, the word of God commands us to read it. That means that the word of God says that the way our brains are wired, God created us to be literate. He created us to read and to experience part of life through, for, through words. It wasn't a man-made invention, y'all. It was God, the word of God. That Bible, this Bible, is the oldest text, the first book ever published in human history. What more evidence do you want about a God when the very book, the very first book, is 100% archaeologically correct. It's, it's been the, the dates, the times, the kings, the eras, the city names, the years that they were spoken of or when they existed, archaeological evidence later, thousands of years later in some cases, as late as uh, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls being found. In the last 30, 40, 50 years, a ton of them all throughout those decades. In fact, one of them, I think, is right the year that, that Israel was reborn, 47 and 48. All of this evidence that every word in that is very, the very breath of God to give us life. And we go, no, I don't want the pork. I don't want this. I don't want that. Do you know what the book of Proverbs does? When you listen to it, because the Bible says that faith cometh through hearing, not reading, hearing and hearing the word of God when anything is spoken twice in the word of God. It's for emphasis. It's like screaming in that culture. It's like you, they're screaming. Well, see, if somebody was reading the Torah and we were sitting there, we were hearing it. They, they didn't have copies. They didn't have paper. They didn't. Have, by the way, we don't either anymore. There's a paper shortage because of the New World Order. Squirrel, let me, just, let me just get your attention. We have one of the greatest gifts in the world, that word of God. We do nothing with it. And then when we listen to it, we buffet it out until we want this part. We don't want this part. And let me tell you what I did the other day. 
Um, I really like this Bible app called um, NIV Live. It's a bunch of my buddies. They spent $6 million on the theatrical version of it, the audio theatrical. So when you put it on, you just you just go away and you're listening to sounds. And then, I don't know, it's Jesus on the Mount of Olives. You can hear children playing. You can hear birds chirping. You can hear a little music in the background. You've got extraordinary actors that speak these voices. And it takes you there, guys. So the other day, I hear, hear Cindy Ellis talk about Proverbs. I put in the book of Proverbs, I close my mind, close my eyes, and I'm just breathing deep. I'm learning how to relax. I'm getting into complete focus on the word of God. The word's meditation, but some very immature Christians freak out over that word, even though in the original language, it's over a thousand times. In the where Every time you see the word pray, it's a form of meditation, but Christians don't want to look up original language because we've become complacent. We've become lazy. But I'll tell you something. When I, it's like the Bible in the book of Proverbs says that wisdom is, it's better than gold. It's better than silver. It's better than anything you can find. And when I uncover these things for my own life, I just get excited. Why? Because I'm feeding myself the word of God and I'm sitting there and I'm listening to this book of Proverbs, y'all. I don't know if you've ever done it. If you've ever done one session where you just listen to a theatrical version that takes you there, all these different actors and you realize a lot of my life is foolish. By the way, three different kinds of people in the whole world, fools, evil, and wise. Fools learn through pain, pain. You ever been deceived in this world? You ever been hurt? You ever been any? Almost 100% of that is the fact that you participated in that deception. You lived a life a certain way and, it, and, it, and you participated in the deception, the betrayal, because God gives you pointers, gives you in the book of the wisdom books, how to be uh, joined together in business or marriage or anything uh, with the right character of people. He gives you tests, he gives you ways, he gives you discernment through that. So anyway, I'm listening. And I'm just kind of going, and I hear this part. Ooh, that's a smorgasbord thing. I, like, let me give you one. Uh, a fool responds to somebody screaming at them with a loud, louder voice. How many times have you been in a fight with a loved one? I just saw my siblings do it the other night. Uh, not my siblings, uh, my, my children who were siblings of each other. Um, I, I thought to myself, how many times have you raised your voice louder, 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 thinking that's going to win? Now, even um, somebody with a IQ of three knows that's not really how you win an argument. Do you know that there's a bunch of passages there about how you handle a quarrelsome person? How you handle somebody with a spirit of offense? How you handle people in authority? How you deal with people with integrity? And as I'm listening to it, I can just feel my heart being ripped apart. You know what that is? That's the great surgeon. You see, one of the tactics against the enemy is to allow God to come in and fix your hearts. Book of Jeremiah, it says the heart is deceitfully wicked above all who can know it. Doesn't even mean that at all. Bunch of Christians, bunch of pastors, bunch of leaders, bunch of Bible teachers walking around like idiots because they think that English word, uh, the heart is deceitfully wicked above all who can know it. No, no, sorry. Let me tell you what that passage says in the original Hebrew. Those words describing the heart mean lied to, cheated, betrayed, hurt, walked upon. You see, the word of God in the book of Jeremiah is saying your heart has been trampled on. Actually, the, the really most accurate stuff is it's been walk up, walked upon. There's an impression made a footprint on your heart. Do you know that today in science, we know that footprints are cellular memory. It's an actual print, call it PTSD, call it whatever you want, of the divorce, of the bankruptcy, of the death in your family, of this. And God, and, 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 and Jesus comes, fully God, fully man. Check this out. Check this out. They say, hey, dude, what are you doing here? Hey, rabbi, what are you doing here? He says, I've come to heal the brokenhearted. You see, our hearts are sick. They're deceitful. The, the word deceitful is wicked is crazy. They're broken. You have a broken heart. One of the, one of the ways the enemy jacks up your life is he robs you of your identity. 
let me just be real clear. Your identity, once you accept Christ as Savior, is found only in the Word of God. Your identity is found only in Christ. It's not you being a millionaire. It's not you leading a company. It's not you being a dad. Nothing wrong with any of these, by the way. It's not you being a son or a brother. Your identity is Christ. They were called to put off the old nature and put on the new. So one of the tactics of the enemy in your life is to hold you back from who you really, truly are. So you got a bunch of phonies walking around with identities. I think about a lot of these rock and roll guys that are, you know, they were always 10 years old and kind of the hippie generation that I grew up in. And they were the older hippies, right? So you look at the Rolling Stones and they're like 80 now. And I look at them and I go, they have masqueraded so long into this identity. I'm not judging, I'm assessing. I'm not, see, judging is this just because I don't know any way to say in this. Just the everyday Christian doesn't look up anything. The word judgment is most easily understood because we're not supposed to judge like this. I look at them or I look at famous people or I look at rich people or I look at people that are, I don't know, fat, short, skinny, whatever. And I am smoking cigarettes, not smoke. And I think I'm better because I don't do that. That is the spirit of judgment, my friends. But discernment is never supposed to leave us who we should hang out with, who we shouldn't hang out with, what we should participate in, who we should couple with, who we should be yoked with, who we shouldn't be. God never called you to not do that. Grow up, learn what the word judgment is. If you're walking around thinking you're better because you don't smoke pot or you don't do what they're doing, you don't sleep around, I got news for you, man. That's not what God's called you to do. So when I look at things and I look at situations, I can assess them. I can understand them. I can have discernment about them, but I'm not to judge them. It's one of the lies of the enemy. See, the enemy wants you to not even do discernment anymore. Because, you know, you're a Christian and you shouldn't be judging. Not true, man. It's not how the world works. Not how God's matrix is set up. So I look at this and I say to myself, Back to the casket people. Those people that walk with wise people become wise. I now really covet and get excited about the company of wise believers. People who have unearthed the treasures in this word of God. You see, if you're not hungering and thirsting for water, you're dying if you're not hungering and thirsting for the word of God, you're already deceived because that is, that is the water of life. That is what transforms you into your true identity. This is good stuff, man. You need to take notes. You need to think about this, ponder it, consider it. It's good because I'm doing it. Nope. It's good because it's truth. It's good because a lot of churches aren't going to be honest with you anymore. Why? I, I, I just recently, um, were part of your part of your contributions go to this uh, one of the biggest anti-abortion clinics in southern in uh, all of California, but it's located in Southern California. And they're trying to do a annual fundraiser in the. Uh, eh, I'm not going to tell. I'm not going to say where it is, but Southern California, because I don't want to get anybody in trouble here. And they can't get a, bi a building without a vaccine passport, so they went to the largest church there. Uh, because they had the, the size of uh, everything they needed. And quote, the, the pastor said, I can't do it. Not because of the vaccine passport, because it's an a anti abortion or I don't think they use that term. I'm using it, I think, inappropriately. It's, it's, it's saving tens of thousands of babies' lives. Isn't that cool that you guys are participating in that? And, and that's been kind of recent the last couple of months. Um, they said they couldn't get a facility because the pastor made a decision not to speak pro-life messages in his congregation because he knows he'll lose, I think he said, 20% to 25% of the Christians. Satan is a liar. And a lot of the spiritual warfare you thought was spiritual warfare, screaming and hollering at the devil, it's a bunch of idiots. They don't, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say it so, so harshly. 
but kind of I did. You got to understand the principles of warfare. The, the greatest principle of, war, of spiritual warfare you're ever going to learn how to do is to persuade your heart through the word of God, through worship, through, the, through um, prayer, that you are the finished work of Christ. That the death, burial, resurrection has given you the power of God. You know what I could have done? I actually thought about it. I actually thought about it. I'm going to give you everything you need to know about Satan. And I was going to speak for like 10 seconds and then shut this off. Satan, this is what I was going to say. Satan has only as much power as you believe he has. And he has none if you believe the truth. Let me just repeat that. In your life, <laughs> Satan has no power over you other than the power you give him that you believe he has. And your fake false identity is being built instead of your true identity in Christ. I'm telling you guys, hey, I don't have this down. Do you? I, 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 I'm, I'm really, in, ever since I got into the ministry part of life, sort of despise pastors who come off when a couple of names come to my mind, I'm not going to speak them, that they're holier than thou and they walk with God and one of them out of Texas has got to be 350 pounds and he's internationally known. And I'm like, dude, you don't even have self-control. Who are you kidding that you've got this down? Who are you kidding? A lot of the word faith movement, even though some of the word faith movement is kind of accurate and that kind of it is. A lot of it has just perverted the word prosperity. And yet God wants you to prosper even as your soul prospers. I wish it all above all, as Paul says, I wish above all that you would prosper even as your soul prospers, your mind, your will, and your emotion. Why was the wisdom of God right there? Because he knew Satan would destroy you with wealth. I was in a home of a very famous author way back in the 80s named in business named Tom Hopkins. Actually, it was in the early 90s. And uh, I, was, I was in his home with the, uh, the uh, CEO of a company called A.L. Williams, big old guy from Texas, man, he had to be like 6'6", six, six. he had a big old, you know, Texas belt on. <laughs> and uh, I was 30 some years old and I was leaving a job, million dollars a year, million dollars a year, 30 years old from a street kid in, in California. I'm a street kid in Detroit, but grew up in kind of my younger adult years in California. And I, and I looked at him and said, guys, I'm walking away. I can't handle the morality of it. I can't handle the ethics of it. These people, and I go, I'm, you know, I've lived, I've danced with the devil a few times in my life. And these people are way too dark for me. And I, and I remember him saying, let me tell you something about power and money, son, makes a good man better, makes a bad man worse. Turns out he was a Christian, by the way. Uh, it turns out he was actually quoting the word of God. Those that walk with wise people become wise. Those that walk with foolish people become fools. You look at what pride does. You want to know how Satan fell? A lot of people say it's his pride. There was a variety of things. If you look in uh, Ezekiel 28, <clears throat> starting in around 13, you are going to discover his nature, what happened, how he fell, why he fell. And then you're going to realize the enemy of God has been doing the same thing to you your whole life. He has caused you to fall out of fellowship, out of an intimate connection to the Holy Spirit. How beautiful of a tactic is it that you're falling away from God and you're not even knowing what the enemy is doing? Years ago, when I was young, I was mentored by a lot of really great guys in business. One of them was, you have to read The Art of War and just, you know what, I'll save you some trouble. Know thy enemy. <laughs> Actually, it's a very good book. Know thy enemy. One of the top principles. Can I just tell you, most of us don't really know. And we just blame. This is where you need to wake up, church. We blame our foolishness. And then the consequences of our foolishness on Satan's really attacking me, man. I don't know. I really just need your prayer because Satan's like, there's this thing where you just got to do just enough prayer. and You just, your matrix is jacked up. You don't even know what the word of God says here, man. But remember, I told you, I was going to blow your mind at the end with something. I bet you, I bet you 99.9.9999 has never, ever heard about the enemy before. It's pretty cool. So check this out. 
um, one of the things that happens to me a lot, if you're in my life personally, is we'll watch a movie or we'll watch a television series or something. And I'll hear background music from the 50s, 60s, 70s, not so much the 50s, but when you're a little boy in the 60s, um, you're hearing the, the, the music 10 years ago of what they listened to because it's still on, just like today you're hearing music 10 years ago. So even though I wasn't really kind of, you know, able to pay attention, I, I, it was played to me as a 10 year old, 11 year old, 12 year old. So when I hear music, I always realized it was the background timestamp of my life. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You can drive down the road and you hear a song, go, oh yeah, I remember that in high school. And you're moved by it. Why does music, why does music do that? Why do people who never worship in church go to, I don't know, whoever, whatever band you like, YouTube or uh, Aria Grande or whatever age you are, you, you go to it. You know, if you're old, maybe the Rolling Stones. And people are just moving. It's why do, why are we so moved by music? Can I just tell you what the answer is? It's really easy. Satan was the worship leader. As far as I can tell, there's three main character angels. One brought you the word. One brought you prayer. And one brought you music. Michael, Michael, Gabriel, and Satan. And I want you to think about that because that's pretty crazy, right? And so you've got one angel who's constantly bringing uh, the word of God. Gabriel comes to Mary um, through the book of Zechariah, I believe, and brings her the word of God. You know, you, when you get to Satan and you realize... By the way, answering prayer, Michael, the archangel, was always answering prayer. He was being sent to prayer. So you got word, you got prayer, music. You know, when Satan was cast out, one third of the angelical realm fell with him. And many people believe those are the demons today that, that devastate the earth through pockets of influence and all kinds of things. I want you to think about this for a second. One of the tactics of the enemy and, and, and it's so clever how, how the world responded when good Christian folks discovered what music was doing to them and how we just made a mockery of it. Let me just give you an example. Elvis Presley. He went on, I can't remember what it was. I think it was the Ed Sullivan Show. And he was wiggling his hips and people lost their minds and said this was the devil's music. And now today, with our desensitized human consciousness, we just laugh at that. We giggle at that. But the truth is, all music is doing one of two things to you. It's either drawing you closer to God or further away. And it's the background frequency. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting that both light and sound are registered in decibels? They're registered with a, with a certain kind of um, frequency measurement device. Isn't it interesting that those things influence our very beings as of today? So I, I grabbed my Bible and I was going to read it to you guys because I've got these chapters that are just so incredible. And then I realized you don't have the King James, uh, New King James. And thank you, Yvonne, if she's listening, because Yvonne Lusk, um, she gave me some great reference stuff that I've spent time on over the last year and a half. And it's there's there's a really, there's a lot of depth to the whole King James thing, but this is, um, the Ezekiel, uh, starts here, Ezekiel, uh, 28, 13, by the way, I got my white sport glasses on. Those are kind of special looking the work workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Satan didn't create instruments. They were prepared for him. You go back over to Isaiah. I'm going to stay in uh, Ezekiel this whole time, but I do want you to know something. In Isaiah 14, 11, your pomp is brought down to Sheol, which is hell, and the sound of your st stringed instruments. So we know there's stringed instruments. It's really important that you guys hear this. I'm telling you, it's just so, so, so cool. And it's not letting me go to the next one. I guess I have to go down here. Um Ezekiel 28, 12, Satan was full of wisdom 
and perfect in beauty. Ezekiel 28, 13. You were in Eden in the garden. Nobody else was there. S some of the theologians have said this Ezekiel 28 was about the king of Tars, Tarsh or Tarsh. Uh, and the spirit of Tarsh is what he was referring to. You know what Jesus did when he rebuked Peter, said, get behind me, Satan. He went right through Peter to the influencing spirit behind him. You see, in biblical times, the word of God says you need to speak to the spirit behind this, this situation. That's the authority you and I have. If you don't know you have that authority, if you're not walking in that because of compromises of sin in your life, by the way, those are blessing blockers and those are power suckers. You want to know what sin really is? It's I don't want all your power, Lord. You want to know what sin really is? I don't really want to be whole. You want to know what sin is? I want to be deceived. I want to fall down rabbit holes of affairs. I want to fall down rabbit holes of online stuff. I want to fall down rabbit holes of addictions. Let me just tell you, man, intimacy transforms your heart. And here we have, you were in Eden, dude. You, every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamonds, the onyx, the jasmine. I mean, this place was utterly amazing. And you were the anointed cherub that covers, meaning you were not just an angel, but you were anointed as a leader. And I established you. And you were on the holy mountain of God. Can you imagine being on the holy mountain of God? And you walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. Not a problem at all. Go back to uh, Isaiah 14. But your pompous, your pomp is brought down to Shehold. And the sound of your instruments was brought down there. This is going to be so cool. Now you go back to Ezekiel 28, 16. By the abundance of your trading, let's get back to that word in a second, because trading does not mean what, you, what we think in today's world. By the abundance of your trading, Ezekiel 28, 16, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. Can I just tell you that God's words about holy are really important. Do you know that holy is set apart, special, uh, dedicated to a specific thing in God's kingdom? And when you want to fight back Satan, you keep those things holy. You want to know what one of them is? The, the, the Sabbath. You're supposed to take one day off and just rest in the presence, rest with loved ones. You could go legalistic like the Torah. That's not what God's heart. Remember, God's heart and intention is the key to transformation, getting an alignment, getting in harmony with God's heart and intention. This is good stuff. If somebody would have, somebody would have taught me this when I was young, I'd have a whole different life. Now, I want you to think about something for a second. Satan is now cast out. Where did all this music go? Remember the title of this whole message is, you know, how Satan gets to you. One of it is, is music. I just want to finish up with this um, Ezekiel 28 because it's, it's bad to the bone. Ezekiel 28, 16. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, um, from the midst of the fiery stones. Moreover, the word, word of the Lord came to me and said, and these are all the things that man gets through the prophetic word of Ezekiel. It says, is it, going back to um, Isaiah for one second. You will take up this proverb again against the king of Babylon. And then, and then, it, and so what we're saying here, just so we're clear, is there was a characteristics of, of Satan that has come down into the world and it actually affects us today when we understand how he works. And I'm just going to end it with this. And then I'm going to go back to the message Ezekiel 28 13, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you before the day that you were created. Now, think about this for a second. Timbrels and pipes. Now, we already know from Isaiah, there's instruments. We already know that there's stringed instruments. So there's, and this is just so incredible. You were made in the image of God. When God created the cherubs, he was, he was, he created them. God is the creator. They didn't create themselves, right? They were, cre they were creatures, means created. 
that I don't know the image of God print that was so unique to humankind. And I don't know, I'm not smart enough, maybe some theologians are to know what connections we have to angels, but I do know this. We have these three things, percussion, spring, uh, strings, and wind instruments. Are you ready for this? It's 2021. 2021. 6,500 years later after the garden-ish, 6,500-ish years later, I want you to think about this. We got only three instruments in the whole world. Percussion, string, and wind. Now, I know some of them have reeds. It's still wind. I know some of it is now um, uh, technology has created synthesis. All it does is simulate those exact sounds. But God's nature is there's such a, a fingerprint, uh, a touch, uh, a signature of who he is on everything he creates. Check this out. You were born with, within your soul, within your body, percussion, strings, and a wind instrument. No, I'm not talking about passing gas. Listen, think about this for a second. 2021, there's nothing, there's no, nothing else has ever been created than the very instruments that were given to Satan. He comes down and he influences wicked, wicked people who are never going to give their lives to God to create music that does what? That gives you a direction away from the things of the Lord. I was listening to all these different TV series and things over the course of my life, and I can always remember going, oh, there was one on the uh, TV the other day, I'd like to teach the world to sing perfect harmony that whole coca-cola ad for those of you that are old enough to know probably played five six seven eight nine years of my life i actually looked it up yesterday it started in 1971 and yet when i heard it i pictured the hill i pictured the singers i pictured the sound they were a bunch of hippies and i remember as a little boy looking up and going oh, i want to be a hippie what was it doing it was influencing my heart it was, we sound like Joe Biden there. I thought it was really good until I remembered crazy Joe Biden does that. I need you to understand Satan is at war to your destiny. He's stealing, killing, and destroying who you really are, what you're truly capable of doing. You know what else is holy? The tithe. I have not always been obedient in this area, but I know people that have for decades, my wife, for one, I got to tell you something. I don't know. Should probably shouldn't say that. I probably should. No, that's not cool. <laughs> that's between her and God. I want to tell you this though. I want to tell you something. The most successful people I know. I got a buddy in uh, um, Illinois, around the Chicago area. He's one of my closest um, buddies. That's a rock star in business. Made eight point five million dollars in income last year. He's a man of God. He's a man of integrity. I have seen him. Uh, uh, do rebates back to people, refunds, however you want to call it, for hundreds of thousands of dollars that they were completely wrong in. I knew the whole set of circumstances. I knew the procedures. I knew everything about this particular thing I'm thinking about. And he did it just to, just to have any erase doubt about his character. I can tell you one of the things that when I first met that man, he's kind of old school, even though he's younger than me, he's sitting at his office desk one day and I walk in, I go, what are you doing? He goes, what do you mean? What am I doing? I'm paying bills. I go, no, no. What are you doing? You got all this paperwork all over your desk. And at this point in our careers, we were partners. And we were walking into boardrooms and we we're walking into, you know, powerful executives all day long and, and teaching them cutting edge strategies and methods and tactics. And, and it's a very uh, interesting way of making a living because it's some of the most big, some of the biggest egos in the world run these companies. And, you know, writing checks with papers, 25, 30 years old, you need to just go online, hit a button, it's done, right? And he goes, that's ah, just the way I do it. And besides that, these are all just actually not my bills. He wasn't bragging. It was in a beautiful heart. He goes, these are just, you know, contributions I make. I go, what do you mean? He goes, just people that, you know, I consider this all part of my tithe. And I look and it was like 70 or 80 things. I didn't think much about it. And I just 
I mean, really, there was just a stack and it was just this organization, this nonprofit, this nonprofit. So then we're driving on the road, I don't know, a few days, week later, whatever it was. And there's, you know, homeless person in Chicago. And we're in a, you know, $125,000, his, his $125,000 $125, Range Rover and pulls over and kind of an interesting neighborhood. And uh, he starts giving this guy money. He doesn't just do that. He starts engaging him and asking him how he got there. Tell me your story. We're on our way to a really important meeting. We weren't late or anything. We had a, by the way, one of the things that the enemy will steal out of your life is time. One of the ways you take care of that is open up any book and any, anywhere. I don't care where it is. Look what the side of it. See that? There's a margin. Your life needs margins. You don't do back to back to back to back employments. You give yourself margins so things can go over and under and you can actually be a good Samaritan. You're giving God a time set aside, a holy thing set aside just for him. You know what else is holy? Your body. Did you know that? You need to set it aside. Book of Romans says, but it, it, those of you that are falling into sexual sin or you have, or you still are, even emotional affairs online, just crazy stuff that the enemy has deceived you in. Crazy stuff that you participated. Can I just tell you, you're, you're just leaking out the power of god it's as if you got a blessing blocker but back to giving this guy constantly gives and uh i've never seen him lack anything i've seen him go through hell i've seen him go through five ten million dollar lawsuit i've seen and the guy just keeps going you know that everybody i know that gives with a cheerful heart everybody i know that does that part of their life holy is financially whole isn't that interesting and yet here i am this isn't about you it's about me i'm just i believe in transparent ministry people ask me you know why did you do this at the last part of your life because this you know i'm in the last chapter like it's really easy. I didn't see Noah's Ark being built my whole life until this season. And it just woke me up. I don't know what else to do. Now I'm starting to coach a lot more executives, faith-based coaching combined with things. I, I think I'm going to try to do that to supplement things going on here, but there's so much going on. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm putting it in God's hands, but here's the point. We need to start understanding the tactics the enemy uses when we don't keep things holy that he says are holy we need to understand the things like music well now you sound like the 50s nails presley well there was a little bit of truth there look what the 60s hippies did to this world that leadership team of the schumers and the bidens and the clintons that whole air is a bunch of hippies self-centered ignorant, unwise, foolish, I'm not talking about those people in particular, but that whole generation of leaders, fools, destroying the most godly nation. Or, you know, you, America had all kinds of problems. Sure it did, because it had free will, man. It had free will bit built into it, but the principles of God were in the constitution. They had, the founding fathers had studied every philosopher in the history of the world, all of the scriptures, all of them, including the word of God. And they said, let's just put the undergirding of the constitution. Let's embed it into the truths of the Judeo Christian principles, because nothing is greater. And all the hippies did was try to erase that and look at the chaos of our lives. That, my friends, is the same thing the enemy is doing to you. He's robbing you because of your lack. My people perish for a lack of knowledge about everything. That, that passage in the Bible is about everything. My people perish for a lack of knowledge about the enemy. Know thy enemy. So I look and I go, percussion, strings, and wind. Not only is it in every instrument today in the entire world every single instrument spoken of in the word of god in the original hebrew language there's still only three today do you realize the evidence of that and yet god did something else he put them into us what do you mean percussion what do we do in church what do we do at a, at a rolling stone concert or an Ari Gande if you're if you're younger what do 
What about strings, Michael? There's no strings. Oh, yeah, there is. You know what vocal cords are? Two strings that rub together. They vibrate just like my guitar strings do. Just like violin strings do. Just like a mandolin, a banjo. They're stringed instruments embedded into our souls. How does it come out? Through our breath, through the, through the blowing of breath, through wind instruments. Your body is an instrument to worship God. Wow. What are the three pillars of worship in any church, any place? And by the way, when you're all alone, it's the word of God, it's prayer, it's musical worship. Nothing's changed. You see, the evidence of a life well lived, the evidence of how to stay connected to God, it's everywhere. The evidence of how to eliminate the enemy from your life is everywhere. And it's all found right here. And if you go like this and dust comes off it, I can tell you that you've fallen into one of the traps of the enemy. Remember the three angels, the word of God, prayer, and music. The three kinds of things that were created to make this thing called music that God alone created. These three things are embedded into our souls. And you got a bunch of men going, well, I don't really like worship in front of people. I'm just not really like that. And then they go to a football game, have three beers, and they look like they lost their ever-loving minds. Men, wake up. I don't know why, but there's a secret in Christianity. Men are nowhere near as mature in the faith as, as females. It's a statistic. In fact, in certain ethnic churches, I just saw the statistic the other day, 85% of the entire congregation is females. Most of this ministry is females. Most of the churches that have participatory ministries are females or females that drug their husbands. What is wrong with us men? You know what real men do? They show how to worship to their children. They don't hide it. I'm not, I'm not bragging. I'm not, I'm just saying what it is. I, I never really hid who I was. I could be this lukewarm version Christian. And I remember being on a date 20 some years ago in a church. And I remember just this, I said, I'm going to go to church and said, do you want to go? And this person said, yes. <clears throat> and uh, I remember worshiping and I uh, was just caught up in it, right? I wasn't showing off. I wasn't trying to be a Christian. I just knew I needed Jesus. It's in Orlando, Florida. And just as I'm talking to you, I can vividly see the whole thing. And out of the corner of my eye, I looked at her and she was crying. And I thought, oh, well, she's worshiping the Lord too. I didn't know what kind of Christian she was. We talked about it, but I didn't know. It was the first time we'd ever been in church together. And this person, when we walked out, she goes, I've never seen a man do that in my whole life. I could do what? What are you talking about? Like, I wasn't playing naive. I wasn't manipulating her. I was honestly asking a question. I said, what are you talking about? She says, worship and not be intimidated. I, I don't know if it was because I grew up on the West Coast. I don't know what it was. But I was blown away by that. And you know what? She was right. She was right. And I think to myself, do you not understand you were created as an instrument of God? Literally, you were made to just glorify God. You were made to be one. This is a message you should have everybody you've ever known listen to. You know why? Because as I'm hearing it come out, I'm sensing the Holy Spirit. I'm seeing men and women giving up their power because of their addictions. You know, your power is either going into the deeper things of God or it's going into your addictions, but your power is going somewhere. And the lies that you've been told about your food, your drugs, your alcohol, your porn, whatever it is, the lies you have been told about it are just that, deceptions. It's going to be impossible for me to quit smoking, quit eating, quit drinking. No, it's not. That's a lie about the power that you're giving up. 
men that are addicted to porn is a piece of plastic. You have di- piece of plastic taking dominion over women just almost as much. The statistics are surreal right now. And the next generations, man, when I was a kid, I can tell you right now, I remember exactly, I was actually praying about this last night. I remember the very first impartation of pornography. I was in sixth grade and somebody stole a Playboy or something like that magazine. We're up in a tree fort and it was this hidden treasure that was up in that tree fort, you know, and we all knew it was there. That's not the way kids grow up today. It's everywhere. Why? Because that's the tactic of the enemy. We got to understand, know thy enemy, who we are in Christ, where we're going, where we're headed, who's influencing us, who's carrying the cost, cough, cough, um, coffin. Every once in a while, my brain just goes, yeah, it's drug, you know. Sp- speaking of that, what are you allowing to stop you when God's willing to heal you? I was on a, <clears throat> a call with the... Um, saving the babies organization with some of their leadership team board members and stuff. And one of the gals on this call was a PhD, uh, very bright gal, uh, born in Jamaica, grew up in uh, parts of New York, um, uh, very kind of impoverished, put her way through PhD in and out of some really tough seasons of life with uh, divorce and ended up in beautiful places in Southern California doing God stuff. And, and uh, the board member that introduced us on this Zoom, and he told me all about her before we met, of course, and vice versa, and, and he wants us to uh, give counsel to the board and blah, blah, blah. And, and so she begins, to, he told me there was a lot of similarities. I'm going, he and I are just getting to know each other. He might be listening to this. I don't mean this in a bad way, but we've only known each other a few months, so we're, we're still learning about each other. So I'm wondering how accurate his view is, whatever he's saying, Sharon is what I'm trying to say. And she says, yeah. And then I had my stroke and, and it turns out she had a stroke just about the same time I did. She had to learn how to talk and she actually had motor skill problems. She had to learn how to walk again. And, uh, and I go, well, we do. Ha- I didn't, I don't, I don't think she knew that part of me. I go, well, we have the same thing. And we talked about how we leaned into God to heal us. Right. And I got to tell you, you know, uh, it's very humbling when your whole life you made a living uh, in business by knowing specialized pockets of knowledge that most business people didn't know and bringing it to them and delivering it through this gift of speaking. And then the gift of speaking gets taken away through the, through the horridness of the enemy's work. And you, and you wake up and you go, well, who am I? If I'm a carpenter and I don't have any hands, what do I do? That's what I felt like. And when I still get stuck on words sometimes, I think about the humility of it and the battlefield scars of what the enemy has tried to do to my life, try to do your life. And yet we're called to persevere. We're called to, we're called to lean into God. We're called to just do what he's called us to do anyway. You know, I speak by God's grace. And I don't ever take that for granted. I don't know how many more words I'm going to have, or you're going to have, but I want them to be the word of God. I want them to be, because because all of us have a, the Bible says that all of us have a moment, a time appointed, it's appointed on a man once to die and then the judgment. I don't know how many more words you're going to be allowed to speak in this life, but when you cross over, it's only the words that you've done for the kingdom that are going to matter. Death is the great equalizer. <clears throat> Your car's not going. I don't care how big. I, I got people in my life right now that are incredibly wealthy. And guys, I wouldn't want to be them for all the money in the world. <clears throat> I would love to have their wealth for the kingdom of God because that's all I want to do. I'd love to be a re- reverse tither where, you know, you live on 10% and you give away 90. I'd love to have that life again. And if God gives it to me, that's how I will live it. I, I guarantee it. <clears throat> but I want to tell you something. The only savings account that you can take with you is what you do for this kingdom. And we're all on a very short timeline here. Whether we, whether we cross over through natural causes, whether we're raptured up, whether it's the second coming, we are in the end game of what's called the church age, the 2000 years since Christ died, May 14th, 1948. I was trying to make tick, 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 tick. There's a time clock ticking. Bible says that 
Jesus, red letters, man, red letter stuff. Jesus says that generation will not pass until my second coming. You know who's trying to steal that from you? Your savings account that you carry over? Satan. Book of uh, Ephesians, I think it's uh, chapter four. None of this is prepared. Well, a lot of this was prepared, but most of the stuff I talked about, the Holy Spirit just inspired. In Ephesians is the schemes of the enemy. It refers to the patterns of behavior that the enemy uses. Look around at your friends. Look around at your music. Look around at your time. Look at those three things. Are you in prayer daily? Forget about Sunday. Like Sunday should be the, it is for me. Sunday is the celebratory day of my Christian life. I go to church to do the exact same things with a bunch of people around me because that's a whole different corporate experience. And the Bible says to forsake not the assembling one another. That's what we're doing here is form a church. There ain't nothing like being in that building. There ain't nothing like listening to the word of God. There is nothing like it in the whole world. So y'all need to get, get in there. But let me just tell you, man, what are you doing right now with your life? With this little bit of time that we have, what are you doing to lean into the deeper things of God and influencing the kingdom? Can you imagine, if you could see it with your eyes, every day you're either expanding or contracting the kingdom. And every day you're either growing in intimacy towards God, losing touch with the craziness of this world, or you're becoming more attracted to it. And it's all based on these instruments, these three parts of worship, the word of God, prayer, and the worship of the Lord. You see, when we know how to fight back, when we know what the battlefield really is, and we know that he doesn't have any power, we don't get him, we already won. Do you understand that? We already won. We have total victory over Satan, Jesus on the cross goes, it is finished. I've defeated him. Now, to the degree that your heart believes it, that's how much victory you'll have. How is that going to happen? Word, prayer, and worship time every day. Like a holy hunger. If you don't have it, pray for it. God will give it to you. <clears throat> Lord, give me a holy hunger. Hey, Lord, show me everything that is separating me from you, all these thoughts I have, secret flirtations you're doing in your offices, the online stuff that you think nobody knows about. You know, it's crazy. Google knows. The computers all over the whole world have got a, a footprint of everything you've ever done. Do you not understand that technology is a knockoff of who God is, that you don't understand that God knows even more than that? God knew how to give man the insight to build the technology that God has in his, he said the word of God, and I say, I think it is, says that by his knowledge, he spoke things into existence. He, by his wisdom, he just did all the math in the known universe. Do you know how much higher that is than AI? And all the things that Google can keep track of? If man can create an instrument to keep track of everything in your life, and by the way, it's gazillions of, 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 of bits of information about who you really are. How much more do you think God has? And you are participating in this ultimate universal matrix. And you're either putting data into the plus or putting data into the negative. You're either worshiping and connecting deeper to God, or you're being lied to and, and led astray by the enemy. So listen, man, I hope that you walk away putting the things that are holy in the right place. Holy means set apart just for God. Your body, your tithe, your time, your money, your, your energy, your acts of service, your time in this word of God. Those are holy. Why? So you can be a good Christian with a check mark? No, so you can grow in intimacy into your true identity by default. When you don't spend time in word and prayer and fellowship and these things that build up the true identity in Christ that you are, by default, the enemy starts winning. So choose this day who you're going to serve, but you're going to have to serve somebody. You know, Bob Dylan, when he wrote that song, oh, he was right. <laughs> he was dead on. Choose this day, life or death. And don't let the enemy, he's a punk, he's a liar, 
he's a he's a he's a cheat a thief he comes to steal kill and destroy can you just say enough is enough start putting your body aside as holy start listening to the holy spirit start leaning into these things that i just saw listen to this teaching over and over i'm gonna listen to it two or three times because i heard i i had about 25 percent of this ready the holy spirit just showed up and i i just saw all these dots getting connected and went wow i just love when god does that i don't care if there's two people here or two million i don't care i'll tell you this i'll tell you this the world needs to hear this message the world needs to, the Christians need to hear this message. The, these, are the, these are the truths of God's word. He built inside of you the exact same dynamics that was in the enemy to, to worship. This is why he did it, to, give, to bring him glory. And what are we doing with it? What are we doing with our percussion? What are we doing with our strings? What are we doing with our wind instruments? What are we doing with these? Guys, clock is ticking intimacy is everything by the way you are deeply loved and valued here if you need me if you're having a hard time and you want to get real um with god don't don't waste my time don't waste yours but if you're serious and you need one-on-one -on -one, just write me a thing we'll get on my calendar and we'll um, do iron sharpening iron and we will invite god into deliverance and healing in your life amen love you guys see you soon blessings